Good evening, I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sharad Kutin. Welcome to Consider This, the show where we want you to consider the news of the day and then reconsider it. So we're going to start with a bit of a theme today on all the stories that we're going to cover. Democracies in trouble. Now let's begin with the extraordinary rebuke from Britain's highest court. The UK Supreme Court has ruled that Boris Johnson's decision to suspend Parliament for five weeks was unlawful and judges said it was wrong for uh, wrong to stop MPs carrying out duties in the run-up to the Brexit deadline, which is uh, October 31st, effectively declaring Parliament back in session. Sharad, what's your read on the situation there in Britain? Well, you know, like many Malaysians who kind of look at foreign affairs as some kind of dr uh, drama from a distant land, the ongoing debate around Brexit and how to, as it were, deliver it by uh, various uh, British Prime Ministers, because Boris Johnson being the second after Theresa May, uh, is something to keep uh, an eye on, only be if only because it in some ways exemplifies how democracies work. Now, this particular setback for Boris Johnson after many uh, setbacks in Parliament I think it's just yet another moment when you look at the way in which democracies work. Mm. Because you know it went to the Supreme Court only because various courts, one in Scotland, one in, uh, one in Ireland, one in, in, in Britain, failed to kind of agree on whether Boris Johnson had the right to prorogue or suspend Parliament. Right. Well, you know, I, I agree with you. I think this is interesting, it, it just simply in terms of not just, just watching the drama that's happening there, but also what we can learn from this. Because, you know, I, I'm reading a New, a New York Times article, and it said that this is a seminal moment in Britain's legal history where the courts have historically steered clear of political discourse. Now, what this essentially is, is just... You know, having strong institutions to provide a check and balance to government. And this is something that Malaysia perhaps can learn a little bit about. Yeah, it's, it's a structure of parliament. I think, you know, the, the Supreme Court had three questions before it, uh, including the question of whether it had the right to weigh in on this mm. issue. And, you know, the what was interesting was you had uh, unanimity with within the Supreme Council, uh, Court, right? So there you had 11, there were, because 12 judges of the Supreme Court, only 11 sat for the case. Uh, they were called back from their holidays and or wherever. They, they rushed back, yes. Because it was a... <laughs> utmost importance uh, to determine exactly what was going to happen with British politics. Of course, it's left up to Parliament now mm. to play this out, right. but it was important that the courts had had a unanimous decision. And I, and I think it's also interesting to see the conversations coming out of this. You know, uh, the media has been quite mixed in its coverage. I think uh, one of the comments that I've seen has been really what does this reflect about Boris Johnson's government? Because it seems that it's adding to the perception that uh, Boris Johnson Johnson's government is willing to run roughshod over Britain's political conventions in its zeal to achieve Brexit. Yeah, and there's also, I think, uh, this really interesting way in which the British media, like so many media in uh, democratic countries, is politically aligned. And so the pro-conservative Tory party uh, papers uh, were critical mm -hmm. of the, the judgment by the Supreme Court, as much as those who are critical of Boris Johnson and, the, the, you know, and his agenda of perhaps pushing Britain towards a no-deal Brexit, uh, they all displayed their politics and their inclinations on the front page. But, you know, you're expecting the courts actually not to express political views. You expect the courts to uh, express legal opinion mm. that's grounded in an understanding of the system of governance. Right. right. Well, OK, well, that's the, a troubled democracy over there in the UK. We're going to move over to the US, where the Democratic Party has begun a formal impeachment inquiry into President Donald Trump. This over allegations that he has, he pressured a foreign power to damage a political rival. Now, there were allegations that Trump had withheld aid to Ukraine while he was pressing the country to investigate Democratic presidential candidate Joe Biden as well as his son. Yeah, this story also has elements of a whistleblowing from the intelligence system. It has elements of the ongoing tussle in a very unconventional presidency. Uh, Donald Trump, uh, you know, said he was not from the swamp that he wanted to clean up. He's, cause mm. he's become a, a sort of a swamp monster of his own making, I guess, uh, for his, uh, you know, detractors. But what is really interesting in, in this is how the American public is going to react. Because 
it said over and over again, Melissa, that the American public is very divided. Oh. And when Trump says, you know, that he's the victim of a witch hunt, I think it was a, one of his tweets in response to Nancy Pelosi's announcement uh, that they will begin this in impeachment inquiries, not an impeachment process, process yet, it's, yes. just, it's just an inquiry into We have into to it. make that point, right? This is just the inquiry. It's not yet a, a process that will go through. Yeah. And you're absolutely right, you know, in terms of Donald Trump's responses, he's completely denied this. But I think it's interesting in terms of timing, right? So you talked about the sentiment uh, of the uh, American public. Now, for me, it's a question of timing. What's changed for Nancy Pelosi as well as the Democratic uh, Party? You know, we've had talks about a possible impeachment inquiry or process all the way to the Mueller investigation, the Mueller report, right? But I feel that that was because it happened in kind of dribs and drabs, you know, it didn't happen all at once. It was a kind of slow burn process. And this was like a, you know, a hit in the guts kind of thing. It happened all at once. Perhaps the sentiment will be different with the American public. What do you think? I, you know, I'm not American. <laughs> I have no skin in the game. Uh, you know, the last time I was in the U.S., uh, my own sense of Americans and their response to institutions like the presidency and all that, uh, it's very curious. It's very unlike us. Mm. We kind of uh, want our executive to be strong. We expect our government to be coherent and you know, act in concert uh, towards whatever goals they have. But in an American situation, you have many people who say gridlock is fine. Yep. You know, in fact, much of American life carries on without government. And many people are uh, of the opinion that the smaller government is, the less consequential it is, the better for everybody. Definitely. So no doubt an interest star interesting story to watch one we will keep our eye on as it develops. Now, another democracy in trouble, closer to home that is, is Indonesia, where thousands of protesters have taken to the streets to oppose a new law which critics say will undermine the country's anti-graft agency as well as its ability to tackle corruption. Now, they're also opposing a new bill for a criminal, for a new uh, criminal code that would, among other things, outlaw premarital sex. Yeah, so a really difficult one here. I think in Indonesia, you know, along with the protests in Jakarta, we've had, of course, over the last couple of weeks, all the debacles around the hate problems of Sumatra is burning, Jakarta is on the boil. And, of course, in the province of uh, Irian Jaya, or West Papua, as it's also known, uh, a lot of protests have been happening for weeks on end. This week has been a terrible one in which uh, over 27 uh, people have been killed, mm. some killed in a fire and others in other kinds of uh, uh, clashes. So uh, there, again, a, a rested province, not, you know, kind of wanting to be part of the Indonesian um, uh, sort of family of uh, communities. Uh, what's interesting is, and kind of a reminder of what Tun Dr. Mate, uh, you know, spoke about with regard to the Rohingya, uh, deafening silence on the question of West Papua in the international media, also internationally. Okay. Well, you know, just looking at some of the, I guess, the protests when it comes to this new, uh, the revision of the criminal code, I think it's interesting, Shirad. I mean, I'm looking at all the headlines. The international media has picked this up as uh, a protest against the uh, premarital sex law. Uh, and I think it's important to highlight it's not just about sex. I mean, the bill also penalizes pre people who criticize the president's honor teachers uh, of Marxist-Leninist ideology, women who have abortions in the absence of a medical emergency or rape. Essentially, critics of this law, of this bill, says that uh, what it is, is it's deepening conservative Islamic influence in Indonesia, and that's what they are concerned And also, concerned you know, if you look at the extension of the blasphemy laws, I mean, again, yeah. this, this criticism about, uh, you know, creeping Islamization over a country that's essentially secular and has a secular constitution. Uh, uh, the the issue for a lot of students is, and this was part of their banners, you know, they don't want to return to the new order regime of General Suharto, a regime that was toppled 20 years ago with the promise of reforms in making uh, Indonesia truly democratic. So the question is, why would lawmakers want to institute laws that insulate themselves from criticism? Why do lawmakers <laughs> in Indonesia want to weaken, uh, you know, anti-corruption agency that's been so successful and has been lauded internationally? Why do lawmakers in Indonesia want to peer under the beds of its fellow citizens? I, I mean, these are troubling questions. They have decided to hold off on these, uh, <laughs> these laws, Melissa, but it's troubling that they should want to have tabled it in the first place. And okay. if that happened in Malaysia, 
would we be out on the streets protesting, protecting our fundamental okay. liberties? I, I'm guessing these are rhetorical questions. Yes, they are Robert. indeed. They okay, are so what, what do you think we can learn from this, essentially, just very quickly? Well, you know, the importance of a vibrant student uh, movement, the importance of a democratic movement of NGOs, that will signal the drift of countries towards a politics that are anti-democratic, social and fascistic, I think that will be the main takeaway I have there from this story. There you go. All right. Uh, we'll keep our attention on Indonesia and what's happening there. But for now, we will turn our attention to Dr. Mahathir's comments at the UN on the Rohingya crisis. That's coming up next on Consider This. So stay tuned. <laughs> Thanks for staying with us on Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris. With me, Sharad Kutten. Now, earlier today at a side event at the United Nations, Tun Dr. Mahade Mohammad slammed the UN and the Myanmar government for their inaction in resolving the Rohingya crisis. And Dr. Mahade said the UN's silence on the crisis has been deafening and he called what happened in the Rakhine state genocide. So joining us on the line now to discuss the significance of these comments, we have Lillian Fan, who is the chair of the Rohingya Working Group for the Asia-Pacific Refugee Rights Network. Thanks so much for joining us this evening, Lillian. Now, I'd like to begin with asking your initial response. I mean, what did you make of the comments coming out of the, this event at the UN? I thought that Tim Dr. Mahabe's comments were extremely strong and uh, actually very appropriately so. We have seen very little uh, moral leadership on this crisis in recent months. And I think it's actually really at the time for such strong calls to be uh, to be made. And I was very pleased to see that uh, the Prime Minister didn't shy away from using extremely strong language. This is language that has in fact, uh, it has been repeated uh, by very credible organizations, including the UN fact-finding mission, which just about 10 days ago reminded the international community that Rohingya, who are still in Myanmar, are continuing to live under the threat of genocide. So this is not um, you know, a term that is completely unheard of, uh, and I'm very pleased that the Prime Minister was, did not shy away from using it. Now, we have a clip of uh, the Prime Minister, you know, when he made this assertion saying, calling a spade a spade. Let's play the clip. Let us start by calling a spade a spade. What happened in the Rakhine state is genocide. What took place were mass killings, systematic rape, and other gross violations of human rights. Lillian, you spoke about uh, the fact that you know, expert groups have been uh, weighing in on the question of what's happened in the Rakhine State and, saying, and using the, the term uh, genocide of saying that uh, a community is under threat of genocide. But when the word is actually accepted, and this would be by other uh, political powers, doesn't a whole process kick in? I mean, how, what happens when genocide is part of the consensus on the characterization of what's happened in Rakhine State and with the Rohingya people? Well, I think that's exactly one of the problems, Sharad. There isn't exactly what we would call consensus over what happened in Rakhine State and what is still happening towards the Rohingya. There are different terms that have been used. The fact-finding mission has um, been conducting, uh, in fact, investigations. They can't actually go into uh, Myanmar. They've been um, restricted from entering Myanmar. But they have been conducting interviews with many Rohingya and many experts around uh, the region, including in Bangladesh, including here in Malaysia. And they found, uh, you know, last year, actually, in their report, they already found that there was genocide on intent in the violence that took place. And they also documented war crimes and crimes against humanity against other minority groups, including the Rakhine, including the Kachin and others. So it's not only um, the Rohingya who are obviously facing discrimination uh, and atrocities, but the genocidal intent uh, of the nature of the violence that's taking place towards um, the Rohingya was, was, you know, a very strong characterization by the fact-finding mission. But that's not exactly um, accepted by, uh, you know, by all the member states of the UN, for example. This is an independent fact-finding mission. They do reports to the Human Rights Council. 
But then, you know, that recognition of whether indeed uh, a state would recognize the, the United States, for example, or any other um, member state um, of the UN, whether they recognize that as genocide is a, is a separate question. Lillian, so Dr. there also asserted that the Myanmar government has not been trying to resolve the, the crisis, whether in addressing the initial violence or in the issue of, the, uh, of return to Rakhine. Now, would you say that these comments are accurate? I think Dr. Mahave is really talking about the lack of inaction, the lack of action on the fundamental issues, and the fundamental issues would be those of granting citizenship to the Rohingya, which is the basic right that they are actually asking for. It's a restoration of citizenship. In fact, they're asking for. They had citizenship before the 1982 um, citizenship law basically rendered um, the group uh, stateless. So that is one of the fundamental demands, and I think that Dr. Mahave and um, the other uh, uh, leaders in the Malaysian government are very well aware that uh, return voluntarily to Myanmar uh, will not happen unless the Rohingya do see some seriousness by the Myanmar government in addressing that fundamental issue. Secondly, there are other issues. There are other issues of um, freedom of movement, uh, you know, even basic access to services like education and health care that is still very difficult um, in Rakhine State. Um, there's no evidence, actually, that there's really been um, any improvement in Rakhine State. And, in fact, things have gotten worse. There's now an armed conflict between the Rakhines, the Buddhist Rakhine, uh, who are the majority in Rakhine State against, um, you know, with the Myanmar military. So things haven't actually improved. It doesn't mean Myanmar has been doing absolutely nothing. They have, um, you know, built some infrastructure. They've tried to set up a process of repatriation. But, actually, it's not addressing the fundamental issues. It's very much focused on building infrastructure and looking at... Um, procedures, you know, to facilitate uh, return in a very administrative and bureaucratic sense, but it doesn't address the fundamental issues. So I do think that Prime Minister Dr. Mahathir is, is correct on that issue. Lillian, I understand that Bangladesh, China and Myanmar have set up a, a tripartite joint working mechanism uh, to evaluate the situation on the ground for the Rohingya repatriation. It signals China's role in any kind of solution. Does Malaysia have the diplomatic heft of a China to in fact uh, develop a consensus on what is happening and push for action in a concrete sense and you know pressure the Myanmar government into acting on all those areas that you just uh, identified as lacking? I think that we'll really need to see a coordinated diplomatic effort on this issue. You have China, basically, who does have influence on Myanmar. In Bangladesh, too, to some extent. But Malaysia's respect in, um, you know, res uh, the respect for Malaysia and Bangladesh is extremely high. Um, I think that there's a lot of trust um, in Malaysian uh, leadership's ability to speak out on fundamental issues um, from um, you know, the Bangladeshi side, there's, a, a, of course, a lot of gratitude towards Malaysia for supporting, even on the ground, operationally, um, the humanitarian crisis uh, through the, the Malaysian Field Hospital, which is um, managed by the Ministry of Defense. There's a lot of, um, you know, awareness of the solidarity and a lot of gratefulness for that, for that solidarity. So I do think that Malaysia does have an important role to play diplomatically, and it's quite a different role from China. You know, China has been trying, I think, to find a solution to this issue, but not one that really addresses the fundamental issues. China's approach has been, let's get people to go back as soon as possible. They have really been pushing uh, both Myanmar and Bangladesh to try to accelerate repatriation without actually looking at the fundamental conditions. And they haven't stressed the issue of voluntariness and safety and dignity for the Rohingya, which is something Malaysia is really stressing, which is in fact in line with international standards. And it's what the UN has been calling for as well. Lillian, the last question for you. Uh, you were in a Cox's Bazaar, I believe, where we have one of the largest refugee camps in the world. Uh, what's the sentiment on the ground among the Rohingya people? Uh, are they getting increasingly desperate? Are they, as some people suggest, will become vulnerable to uh, increased radicalization because of the desperate situation they're in? What's your sense of people on the ground? Um, yeah, so Bangladesh now is hosting the world's largest refugee camp, um, as you said, that's Kutupalong, and that's only one of several camps where the Rohingya um, are uh, residing and seeking refuge uh, currently in, in Cox's Bazaar um, and Teknaf area in Bangladesh. Um, I've been many times over the last uh, two years, including with our foreign minister and with our deputy defense minister, and I would say the situation on the ground now is there's a lot of uncertainty. I think that just a few months ago, things, things looked a little bit more positive because what the Rohingya in, in the camp really want is, you know, they do want to go back. It's not that they want to stay in Bangladesh. They do want to return to Myanmar. Myanmar is their home. 
they feel very strongly um, that they belong in Myanmar, but they do want to go back with uh, guarantees of security. They want to go back with consultation. They want more dialogue. They've really been calling for dialogue. And in fact, they were very um, hopeful when uh, there was a delegation from Myanmar accompanied by uh, some Asian officials that did visit them in, um, you know, in, in July, and they were hoping that that would continue. But instead what happened is you know, yet another attempt at repatriation, which was extremely rushed um, with no real preparation. And what the Rohingya have actually been calling for is renewed dialogue um, and something that could be mediated, in fact, by ASEAN. So I think there is a role for ASEAN, but it needs to be one that stops trying to push for you know, repatriation at a time when that's just not possible and actually focuses, focuses on building trust. Um, it is true that there's a lot of vulnerability in the camps. I, I would say it's not just um, radicalization, but it's, you know, things like trafficking. Um, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's lack of work, of course. There's, you know, a, a very high, um, uh, you know, unemployment rate. And this idleness, of course, is, is always a very dangerous mix, particularly in a place that is um, on a border where there's already a lot of transnational um, crime taking place. So I think that there's vulnerability of Rohingya getting caught up in networks that already exist, whether it's drugs, whether it's human trafficking. Um, and I do think, you know, we can't ignore the, the violence that is um, lurking and uh, there's, you know, there's potential in the camp. I think that the youth in the camp are a, a huge, um, they have huge potential and really what they're calling for is education. They are really insisting that they do not want to lose their future. Um, they want education, and the biggest investment that we could possibly make for the Rohingya right now is to try to make that happen for education. Right. Lillian, thank you so much for sharing your insights and your experiences there with us. Uh, we'll go, we're going to come back and look at uh, other issues locally right here on Consider This. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Consider This. I'm Melissa Idris with me, Sharad Curtin. Now, here's what we want you to consider tonight. Recently, the proposed future developments for Kampung Baru in KL were shared with the public and this included plans for a new tower. So, according to Bernama, the proposed tower will be called Menara Merchutanda, although we're not sure whether that's the actual real name. It's going to be 93 storeys tall. Now, the design of the tower takes inspiration from the traditional Malay Sampin and the Tungolo. What do you think about it, Sharad? Well, you know, I was watching social media and it was extraordinary, the kind of pushback, at least within my t uh, part of the Twitter sphere, as it were, uh, which tends to be very urban and liberal. Uh, and also, I think, cognizant of the, the tone in which government should be proposing things, right? So they're very critical, generally. And Melissa, I thought what was interesting is many people said, not another tower. Do we really need a skyscraper? Is this in, in tune with actually the ten of the times? We're facing a climate uh, crisis. Mm -hmm. Do we need more concrete structures? And if uh, you know, Kampung Baru is to be changed and remade in an image of something else. Why does it have to be remade in a mid uh, 20th century image, which is of skyscrapers? Right, those tall phallic shaped <laughs> buildings. Absolutely. As, as said on Twitter, the conversations surrounding that have been quite hilarious. I have to say, you know, I mean, a large part of Kampung Baru's development has been fixated or focused on its real estate value, right? So this is prime land within the city centre, um, and, and that has been the defined part of its redevelopment. Now the question really is, Kampung Baru is so much more than that. It has 119 years of history. You know, why not look at uh, redefining its heritage, perhaps making it for, you know, um, preserving the heritage for, for tourism, perhaps, you know, considerations of a green lung in the city would have been wonderful. Right, you know, some people will say that what we need is a very pragmatic approach to this. Let's give the maximum economic benefit to the descendants of those who first pioneered opening up Kuala Lumpur and, you know, set up uh, their lives in Kampung Baru. Uh, others are saying, well, you know, and perhaps uh, accused of sentimentality, wanting to preserve it as an, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, its symbolism and the, in terms of the Malay community's uh, presence in Kuala Lumpur and so on and so forth. So, I mean, there, I think there's a tussle and it's very right. hard for me. Uh, personally, I, when I look at this, because it seems to be a conversation we return to 
every other year? Or is it every <laughs> year that we return right. to? What is it we're going to do with Kampung Baru? Well, okay, there you have it. That's our take on what's happening with the redevelopment in Kampung Baru. And that's all the time we have for you tonight. I'm Melissa Idris. With me, Sharad Kutin. We will be back with you same time tomorrow night for another edition of Consider This, only on Astro One. Oh, 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 oh